Hello and welcome to the Plant Paradigm Podcast, your space to hear about conversations around sustainability, climate change, environmentalism, and everything that surrounds those important topics. In today's episode, we are doing the monthly paradigm, your deep in this episode, we are doing the monthly paradigm, your monthly debrief on what is going on in the world in conjunction with a specific deep dive on a topic that you've been wanting to hear about. I'm joined today with my beautiful co-host, Shana Harrington. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Very good, thank you. Um, so we are covering today bioplastics. Yes, you are taking us on a deep dive on all things bioplastics. Is it safe? Is it helpful? Is it a solution to our plastic problem? Well, we'll find out. Before we get into it, what do you think? What do you, do you have a... Look, anything single use for me is just a no-go. Yeah. Why would you even bother? But I understand that, you know, medical, it's really important to have plastics and single use. So I think if that's a solution, great. But yeah, on a consumer level, I just don't see the point. Mm, I wonder if that's true or not. Mm. We'll, we'll dive into it. Um, yeah, I'm very excited to talk about that. It's going to be quite an information dense. I tend to go a bit overboard sometimes with research. No. I, I get stuck in holes, Sean will be able to tell you, like hours at a time over the course of multiple days, which is why this episode's a bit late. I just get stuck into it. and. Um, so many rabbit holes, you know, with topics like these. It's just you bounce from one thing to the next, 20 tabs open. What can you do? Just consume it all. Just consume as much as possible. And on a personal note, we signed up for a running event, which we mentioned last episode, and it has now been completed. Yes. It was so unique and amazing, wasn't it? Yeah. Did you love it? I loved it. Yeah, yeah. It was really fun. I don't know if I've ever done an actual event for uh, the half marathon. I think this was actually my first half marathon event. Oh, wow, yeah, okay. Because the first time I signed up for it, it was canceled due to COVID. The second time I signed up for the marathon, canceled because of COVID. Um, and now this one wasn't. Mm. So. Well, to let everyone know, it was a charity event for children in hospital. And it was held in a UNESCO site, a World Heritage Site of Angkor Wat. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Honestly, so beautiful. I just ran along the lake or the moat as it was back in the uh, 15th century. Thank you, 15th century. I did a little fun 3Ks and you did a half marathon, injured, mind you. Yeah. How so did that a few go? Days, a few days before the event, I jumped into the pool. So it's not a sexy injury. It was just me being dumb. Of the shallow end of the in pool. In the shallow end of the pool, yeah. So my ankle was super inflamed and I was limping around. But I ended up just taking a bunch of pills because I, I wanted to. We based our whole two month trip we around did. this event. <laughs> we worked backwards from we booked, this. Before we booked our flights here, yes. we booked the event. So I was really excited for the event. You know, it's a one in, once in a lifetime thing, Angkor Wat. And it's a half marathon. So you've got to train for it in the heat. It's, it's you know, it's hot and humid. So. Yeah, I did really well. Ended up not feeling pain until like the last three kilometers, but I ended up with a PB of, I think a few, almost five minutes actually, which is great when you really look at that 1%, but I ended up finishing in an hour 56 um, for the half marathon. And it was it was really, really fun. Um, at the beginning, you know, you, you joined together a bunch of other people. And you met a few people, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I met heaps of people. You just get the video out. I just got my phone out, started yelling and people just started yelling. That's just the vibe you get at these races, which is why I think races are a great way to get, get you excited about staying fit and active and healthy. Like, how did you find it just doing like the 3K? You still, there was an energy, wasn't there? Yeah, there was um, lots of companies and groups of people doing it together. So that camaraderie and you know, yeah, it was it was really nice. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's it's great for anyone looking to do the half or any kind of event to actually have a race because one, it helps you train for it, um, and just on the the eco friendly side of things, I had my camel back, which we talked about in the last episode with a bladder. So I, I did fill it up with two shots of coffee, which I just bought like these cans from the shop, just two shots, and I did uh, two scoops of cre creatine monohydrate and water for the rest and I only finished about half of it over the course. Disgusting. 
You say that, but for anyone who likes coffee, that was actually a good mix. I ended up drinking some of it by accident days after it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that probably didn't taste as good as the day. Oh, coffee is just horrible in a, in yeah. a little bit anyway. Yeah, it's a good, I didn't have any snacks or anything because with a two hour event, you know, yes, you should probably be eating something for anything more than like 90 minutes, but um, yeah, I didn't have to waste any plastic really for, for the event. The water that they were supplying was in plastic bottles, wasn't it? I didn't see, did you see a water station? No, I didn't. Oh, they were, um, yeah, yeah, on the aid stations. There was plastic water bottles, which was disgusting because you see the aid station and then like a few meters down just filled with rubbish, like no bins. Like at one point there were kids with a rubbish bag picking up plastic because I think they do have deposit re refund schemes there. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the time, nothing. Like, And I you said that the water bottles were like not even half drank. They were just a like sip, sip and sip, throw. Sip, closed, thrown. Like oh. just a, a huge waste of freshwater resources. Yeah, it's horrible. Um, and there was a banana stock, thank goodness. So I just grabbed <laughs> a banana, which was a fascinating species of banana. Fully green, fully ripe. Like, I was like, whoa, this is going to be a hard bit of banana. But I bite into it, I'm like, it's like a custard. Um, which was really a nice little addition. But yeah, stoked with the half marathon result. One of the sponsors was giving out goodie bags with, um, like it was a reusable bag, I remember mm. seeing that, and it said, um, no excuse for plastic. Yeah, no, no, no excuse for single use. Something like that. Yeah, Some so catchy that, phrase. Yeah, and yeah. They, were used, they had in the goodie bag a little plastic. <laughs> they had um, a reusable mm. bottle, which we didn't take because we obviously already have one, mm. and taking that would have just been using resources that, are not necessary. Absolutely. So. And it's so funny to see the other sponsor. The major sponsor for the event was Pepsi. And I always find that so fascinating. Like this, like I was going to get one just for the sake of, you know, it's getting your sugar and, back yeah, up and sugar, but it's what a crap sponsor for a, a health event. But wasn't Iron Man um didn't they have Red Bull as well? <sighs> back in the uh, cans, know. I'm pretty sure it was cans. They had Red Bull at all the aid stations. Oh. But it's just fascinating how they have the worst choice of sponsors, but they're the ones with the money that can actually make it happen. So And look at like AFL, they have KFC, they have McDonald's, McDonald's yeah. all of that. It's it's actually really, really weird. And we're on the hunt for our next running event. Yes. We're thinking it might be Reef uh, Run, Run for, for the Reef. reef. Yeah. And that's a charity event for the Great Barrier Reef. Mm -hmm. So if anyone's doing that, let us know. Yeah, it's it's actually Australia wide. It's really cool that they've set it up. So the and New Zealand, wasn't it? And New Zealand, mm -hmm. yeah. So all the events start at the same time, whether you're in Melbourne or Brisbane or, or Ballarat or wherever you are, it's all at the same time, which is actually really cool and unique. Yeah. Um, and the, one of the random prizes is like an electric car. Like, it's so cool. Come on, win that for us, Tommy. I can't. I'm too <laughs> slow. Um, and... On other running news, we're actually joining, well, we're thinking of joining, I don't know the logistics yet, but vegan ultra runner Matt Grills, he's running from the most westerly to the most easterly point. So I think it's, I forgot what the westerly one's called, but the easterly's uh, steep point, I think. We, yeah, steep point to the Byron Bay Lighthouse. Oh, so he's starting in WA? Starting in WA, heading through. So he's doing 100 kilometers a day for 50 days. And that's starting in September. Yes, or October. Okay. One yeah. of those two. So. Do they have a proposed end date? Well, 50 days from them. I, I don't know. 50 days? 50 days is okay. the total amount of time, but I'm thinking like there's going to be an injury, like 100k. Don't a wish that upon anyone. I'm not wishing, but I'm, I'm you're right. Maybe he'll do it. Like it, it, 50 days in the grand scheme of things, like I think Nick Butter, he planned on doing 100 days, about 80 kilometers a day, and eventually it adds up, but because he's got only 50 days, he could make the whole thing injury free. He really, oh, really? he really, really could. Um, so wishing him all the best, hopefully join him for a few, few runs. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to do a few hundred K, but <laughs> maybe by to, then. Yeah. Maybe a few marathons. We might get in our van and follow him along. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff happening in the running world. Now ready for our headlines. Before we get into them, I just have one other thing to mention. No, that's okay. We had a new five-star review come through and I just wanted to give it a spotlight because it was actually very beautiful. Um, it was by Zia Amazon. She's from the Philippines. I hope, Zia, that is your surname because Amazon is a great surname. Uh, but she said in quotes, I learned a lot from the different perspectives shared by the host and guests. The show opens conversations about different topics that can be applied to communities, end quote. Um, so really, really nice review and if you want to leave one feel free to do so on apple and or spotify 
Thank you, Zia. Thank you, Zia. But let's let's get started with the first headline. Okay. A few people in the public eye have started a campaign to ban fur from the Queen's Guard cap. Britain's Got Talent judge Alicia Dixon and Love Island's Faye Winter have demanded a block by the Ministry of Defence using real fur for the famous ceremonial headwear. There was 106,000 signatures wow. collected. That's a lot of signatures. It is. For any any topic or category, that's a lot. And it's, it's really sad that this is what it's taken for the government to get like headwing on this. Mm. So the government's response was actually really disgusting, really, really um, hard to hear. So currently we have no plans to end the use of bear skins. Bear pelts that are used are the byproduct of a licensed cull by the Canadian authorities to manage the wild bear population. Mm -hmm. This was said in February, 2022, during the petition. The petition ended in July, so just last month. Mm -hmm. Um, since this debate, this sorry, since this statement, a debate was held in Parliament. So in July, mm -hmm. which I was listening to earlier today, which you would have heard snippets of. So we can include the I can include the link of that in the show notes as well. Yeah. Um, and this is what I learned from the debate: seventy-five percent of the UK citizens have said that this is a waste of taxpayers' money, complete Fair waste, point. and it absolutely is. 93% of people in the UK refuse to wear animal fur, including the Queen herself. She no longer has fur in her wardrobe. Well, sorry, she might have it still. She no longer buys fur okay. for her wardrobe. Okay. No longer. So it seems quite unanimous that no one thinks that this is a good idea. Yeah. And according to the supplier chain, one bear is used per cap. So 100 caps were purchased in one year. That's 100 bears slaughtered. And the supply chain can't, or, or even the Ministry of Defence, can't tell us if the amount of bears get slaughtered is different based on their order. So they're saying it's a culling mm -hmm. because they're a nuisance. Yeah. But they, they have got no data to show that if the, the order was two caps, that's only two bears, would 100 bears still be slaughtered in that year? Right. They've just got none of that data to prove. So just making it up because, well, they're saying it, it's a wild bear. So how yes. can you, it's like the whole kangaroo argument. You yes. can't say how many kangaroos are slaughtered because they're in the wild. That's so it's right. just every man, every bear for himself, yeah. really. Really, okay. So the amount being spent is quite large. It's, um, I think it, in seven years, it was $1 million, uh, 1 million pound seven years, something like that. Yeah. It was 819 caps, which might not seem a lot compared to like the defense budget, mm -hmm. but keeping in mind that these are purely for show and there's no like use for them in the defense. Mm -hmm. They're just for show, for ceremonial and tradition, especially with the rise of cost of living now mm -hmm. increasing. That one million, one million pound could really go to something a lot more economical. Yeah, you could feed a lot of people That's with a million right. pounds, like far, okay. So PETA are working, Peter? PETA, yeah, I heard them saying PETA. Yeah, and, like, and that's, I think that's why it came through. So yeah. PETA are working on a fake fur option, mm -hmm. which needs to meet five sets of criteria. Yeah. <laughs> which they seem to have done. The studies show that it, it needed to be like, uh, I don't know, 9.5 centimeters, waterproof, it, it just, everything that they mentioned in the debate, it seemed as though they hit it, but the government is still saying it's not, it's only hitting one of the five criteria. Right. So I think it, the debate is still happening, like mm -hmm. the, the back and forth. So the debate actually ended with the government being requested to meet with Peter. Peter was actually contacted while the debate was happening. Someone, one of the ministers messaged them and that, that Peter like, yeah, we're so happy to be there in any meeting, any time. And they've made a, a fur, a, like a fake fur hat to, to show as a prototype. Yeah. And the minister got very nervous. You could tell straight away. He started like mumbling a little bit. 
he found his feet again, but it was just really interesting to see. Um, but yeah, it just seems to be tradition is the reason that it's staying around. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit skeptical that there may be some money crossing paths with the Canadian government and the fur, and that might be why right. it'd be hard to change this legislation. I don't know. Even if it wasn't money, to change any legislation, as we know, is actually a hugely complicated, convoluted, just it seems like they're adding more stages for no reason. That's People are too maybe lazy yeah. to, to do it. Maybe it's not much as laziness. It was mentioned in the debate that it is really hard to pass anything yeah. and make change, but yeah. it, um, some of the honourable people, whatever they call them, yeah. in the politician or the ministerial yeah or something. I don't, anyway they um seemed quite forward and they're saying that it felt like something was gonna happen oh good but the government needs to want to make that change yeah so they're saying if it's a cost-effective option if it meets all the criteria everything like that they they will definitely look at it and Sounds apparently promising. they have made a change before I'm not actually sure it was something to do with what the horses were wearing, which is really kind of sickening to think of that they were putting like, I don't know if it was bear, but bear skin on a yeah, horse. Yeah. Like that's like a, a bit saddle yuck, or whatever isn't it? it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. So hopefully something can change, but yeah, that's, that's what's happening at the moment. Awesome. Well, you know, that being said, it does sound quite hopeful um, given the end of that. And I love the fact that Peter was getting texted oh, it's so during funny. the, yeah, it's one of those moments. It's just quite funny. Yeah. Um, speaking of wasted tax dollars, this actually wasn't part of my plan, but I saw it come up. Um, there was a COVID app that Scott Morrison brought in and cost the, ta the Australian tax dollar, tax, Pays. taxpayers money, $22 million. And it only found like seven cases and 12 possibilities and they, the Labor government have now canned it. So $22 million to develop this app that never really ever worked. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so taxpayer money is, you know, I understand. It's disposable apparently. It's very disposable, yes. But shifting gears and staying in the theme of Australia, the platypus is under threat of extinction. not so i think the start of this story would actually be quite productive if i just explain what a platypus is we've met people who actually don't know what a platypus is and you know in researching the platypus i actually came across a funny story i think it was emerson someone from australia one of the english prison guards or whatever they would call themselves colonialists brought back a platypus a de dead one to to britain and emerson who was a, in a chief operating position at the time thought that someone had made a joke and stitched a duck bill onto a mammal. So, and it only took like a biopsy to say, no, this is actually how the animal operates. So it is a strange looking animal. So just some facts on the platypus to appreciate the creature for what it is. It is one of Australia's strangest and most iconic animals with a rubbery duck bill, webbed feet, per, uh, fur, pectoral girdles, and splayed legs resembling the skeleton of a reptile. So it's a mix of a lot of different animals. Now it's one of the only two mammals that lay eggs. The other one is another Australian iconic animal, the echidna. So the male platypus actually has a venomous spur, which I didn't know on the back of their feet. So a particular fact that I do love is they have electroreceptors, which means that they can they have a sixth sense, so to speak, where they can monitor their surroundings with their eyes and nose closed, just with this, these receptors in the bill. Incredible. Insane. It's a bit like a dolphin in that sense, and a whale. Yeah, mm. so dolphins obviously use sonar, but this mm. is some sort of other contraption that they have, which is very unique that they've developed for their surroundings. So some key stats on this topic exactly. So the platypus numbers are in decline, and this unique creature is now at risk of extinction, to clarify. Over the past 30 years, their habitat has shrunk by at least 22%, or about 200,000 kilometers squared, which is about an area three times the size of Tassie, to put that in perspective. So it's already endangered in South Australia, and it's recently listed as vulnerable in Victoria. So it's mainly the east coast of Australia that has platypuses. I used to think the plural was platypi. It's platypuses, so in case anyone likes grammar. 
Um, and so a lot of people are believing they should be listed as critically endangered or at risk. Um, now the biggest threats, um, I'm sure you could probably name a few. We've met, we've read some problems on the platypuses, but uh, land clearing, dams, drought, bushfires, and climate change are the main ones. Um, and of course, all of these are impacts of human activity, unfortunately. Um, they're pretty much all destroying the platypus habitats, um, leaving there with nowhere to go. So receptive to lack of food, nowhere to lay their eggs safely, because there are creatures that obviously eat eggs. Um, so they've lost 22% of the habitat. And another way that platypuses die, I think you might know this. Do you remember reading the platypus habitat in... Oh yeah, when we were in Tassie. Yeah. Vaguely. Yeah, the, the fishermen are killing platypuses by accident. So they're trying to catch uh, yabbies. Uh -huh. They set the yabby traps and platypuses get stuck and thousands a year get culled that way um, accidentally. And so a byproduct of the fishing by industry. Byproduct of the fishing industry, unfortunately. Now, not only do we know that if an animal was extinct or in danger, it affects every other ecosystem, but we're in Australia. So everything does affect the indigenous people of the land. So in particular, the Wadi Wadi people see the platypus as their totem animal, which is very, very awesome. So due to this decline, um, it actually has not been spotted at all in their habitat, in their, sorry, their land, which is Swan Hill. So no more uh, platypus in that habitat anymore, which is a, a sacred animal for them. So also bad on that front. How much left? About 240,000 across Australia. So it's, it does sound like a lot, but this is a wild animal. This is, this is not a lot. Um, and for any Australians, we know they're hard to find. Mm, yeah, we've, we've tried. We've minutes to hours <clears throat> finding them. Sometimes you have to get up at 3 a.m. to watch them. Yeah, what's that word where they're just active at dawn and dusk? We learned it recently. recently yeah. Bipectorial or something like that. So they're very hard to find. Um, and so I'll put up a map as well on the screen on where exactly they live now and where they're fully extinct from. So there is a map that has been created. Of course, I can't finish this without saying, what can we do? So obviously not purchasing yabbies is a start to eat that. That's a great little solution. Um, now, another thing, there is a petition going up towards the federal government, um, which I'll leave linked below. I signed on behalf of the plant paradigm and I'll- Did you sign you. on behalf of me? I didn't, but I saved it to send to okay. you. Um, so this will actually go towards creating a global protection target for, a, for, for the platypus. And this extends to other native creatures such as kangaroos, uh, echidnas and, Koalas. and so forth. Koalas, yes, there there may be another topic for the future, but they are not doing well, are they? So yeah, not great news on the platypus, but there are things we can do directly to, to hopefully help because they attract tourists. They really do. I, I oh, go, they're beautiful. So, they're I'm, so cute. Super cute. Um, I'm sure, I hope if you don't know what a platypus is, you've at least Googled it by now. Yeah. It is a very cute, weird looking creature. Well, I'd like to say since we've seen an otter, like an otter and a duck. Mm. Yeah, and otters are really, even the, the furry, feet, the furry, the feet, just imagine the feet is a web. web and the bill, the duck, the mm. mouth. And the, 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 the bill's like brownish gray. Oh. Yeah, that's a really good, um, good distinction. And wonder if there are little family members. Maybe. Do you have our next story? So our next story is Cow Burp Mask Wins Climate Design Award. Former Apple design chief Johnny Ive and Prince Charles served on the grand jury for this contest for this climate change award. Mm -hmm. The award was created to showcase innovative solutions to the climate crisis. Each winner receives about £50,000 and a mentoring from Ive. Okay. I should really check if that's... How you say it. <laughs> it's right. So this mask was developed by Zelp which stands for Zero Emission Livestock Project. Right. It captures methane with each burp. A catalyst oxidizes the gas and releases it into the atmosphere as a carbon dioxide and water vapor. Mm. The company estimates the device can reduce methane emissions from cows, from cow belches, I should say, by more than 50%. This particular technology is well suited to cows that graze in pastures and that wouldn't eat feed that contains additives. 
unsure why. Wonder if it's got something to do with the mask. Yeah, maybe can't. How do, wait, how do they have the mask and eat at the same? These are all questions I have now. These are yep. all questions. That's right. So I don't, it's not fully ready for the yep. market yet. So commercial launch is actually expected in 2023 okay. after the That's design is finalized. Yep. The UK startup plans to offer the mask initially in Europe as a service where subs- you, like, you pay a subscription per year, per cow. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I think you know what I'm going to say about this technology. Yeah. Um, It's great to see that people are looking into solutions about, you know, for the climate crisis. However, it just seems like we're we're fixing a problem that could be fixed in a different way. In a better way. In a better way. So we're, uh, yeah, I think the core problem here is that we have too many cows because we are breeding them purely for eating and milk. So I think that's the real problem that we should be looking at. And I know that's being looked at with cellular meat and, you know, there's so many different options to milk these days. Um, So, yeah, again, I think it's a great idea, but I just think they're focusing on the wrong problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think everyone listening to this could agree that a lentil patty trumps having a cow that's on a pasture with a mask that um, poor cow yeah, like they, they already suffer enough and then they're gonna have to wear this mask and be so confused yeah like how much did humans pick up a stink when we had to wear masks that's right now we're gonna force all the cows to wear them mm. so what do you think about it well i obviously have the exact same opinion as you it's just it seems look the the first thing that actually came to my mind is wow we're starting to admit that cows are potent methane emitters <laughs> which that's, is great yeah that's you know first it's like the first step in recovering from an addiction is admitting that you have a problem. Yeah. And I feel like maybe if anything that I've learned from this story is we have a problem. Yeah. Like, and, and we're creating solutions to that problem that seem very uneconomical. Yeah. I think these wards are really, really great. And like Prince Charles seems to be all over the place with climate change. Is like, that the one who's dating <clears throat> Rachel from uh, Suits? No, that's Prince Harry. No, I'm not, yeah. I'm not up to date with these. That's okay. Mon- mon- monarchs? Is that yeah. What you call it? yeah, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, and another winner, winner of this award I really wanted to mention. Okay. So I thought it was this is a, a better, like this would have been my number one instead of yeah. the cows. Yeah, just needs more funding. I think so. Yeah. So um, they've designed technology to capture microplastics generated by vehicle tyres. So in 2019, a study found that tires were the biggest source of microplastic pollution in California's coastal waters. Really? I've did got not, the studies did not link. not see that coming. Okay. So maybe you can maybe deep dive into yep. that. I haven't. Yep. Um, but according to this study, it was. Wow. So I, like, I think that is something better. Like obviously, mm-hmm. again, The problem is that we've got too much plastic. Let's stop producing the plastic. But, you know. Plastic is in everything. Plastic's in everything. We've got to take the big fish when we can. Yeah. So I think think plastic is an existing problem that we can, we need to focus on in a big way. Yeah. That's a very cool, like tyres. How is it collecting? Didn't read into wow, it, okay. so I, I'll have to. Maybe that can be a story for next maybe, that month. That sounds incredible, and I had no idea that. Really, I had no idea that tires produce microplastics, but that makes sense because they eventually wear down. But I just thought it was rubber or something. Yeah. But well, I suppose mixed in rubbers made from pla- like plastics made from. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. I'm sure all different tyres have different designs, etc. Depending on the thread, the width, the vehicle, the tonnage it has to carry, etc. It's too much. It's too much. Yeah, that's a beautiful story um, for at least a solution in that we're thinking of things. And I love those, um, what would you call them, like incubators that that work on bringing the latest and greatest technologies, um, which is where if I have any hope for the future in climate change, it's these incubators Mm. that are giving especially Gen Zers who are incredibly creative and intelligent and Well, with innovative. this technology that's just progressing rapidly, I think they're our best chance. 
Yeah. So I think these incubators are just, they're going to create some really cool things that are utopic in a lot of ways. Are we ready for the deep dive? Go for it. Enlighten us. Are bioplastics the solution to this plastic crisis? Now, just a quick debrief. All plastics are polymers, and most plastics produced are from fossil fuels, but bioplastics differentiate themselves as they are made from plants. Um, now, this could mean to lower emissions, it could mean it biodegrades faster, but there are a lot of misconceptions here. So let's look at the word polymers that I mentioned before. So wood, leaves, fruits, seeds, and vegetables, these are all certain polymers. And for thousands of years, they've been used to make, make food, furniture, clothing, etc. categories like cotton, hemp, things like this. Now the first plastic biopolymer was celluloid. And that was invented in 1860. So bioplastics is by no means a new invention or a crazy new thing. It's older than petroleum-based plastics by quite a bit, almost a century in fact. Now the field was going quite well up until a major competitor came into the space in about the 1950s. Uh, someone decided that, hey, crude oil actually seems to be cheaper, more efficient, and can create more solutions with a simpler process. And it can be industrialized at such a large scale. We can use it for cars, we can use it for plastics, and many, many millionaires was born then <laughs> after. Now, looking at the chemical compounds a little bit deeper, I think it's time for a little chemistry lesson um, we can squeeze in here. I wasn't fantastic at school in chemistry, but I know a little something, something. Now, ethanol from fossil fuels, we know that because we fill up our car, or some cars, I suppose, with ethanol. And then on the other end, we've got ethylene, which is made from plants. Now, both can be made into polyethylene. Now, one is petrol-based, one is plant-based. One is natural, the other one is artificial, but both end results are identical. And a nice way I like to think of this is, for most people listening to this, we might have heard of cellular agriculture. So if you cut a piece of flesh from an animal and then you create uh, something in a petri dish, under a microscope, both these things are actually identical, but their source is different. So this is the exact same concept, essentially. Now, what's very important to note here is whether they're synthetic or natural, the end result is exactly the same. So this means, and I mention this because this is a very important point, 50% of the bioplastics produced are non biodegradable, meaning that they will be around, around for the exact same time as petroleum-based plastics. So now a consumer, knowing that, goes into a shop, pays the extra $1 or whatever it is to get a bioplastic material, but not knowing that it's going to be the exact same time to degrade as a petroleum-based material. That's the scariest part, and that is exactly why I'm sure you know a lot of consumers are misled and confused. Well, it's complete greenwashing, isn't it, really? Very, but they're not lying. No, they're not, but it's, greenwashing isn't yeah. technically lying either. Very true, very true. So they're stating something without giving all the information, and there is what we're, the term I'll explain just below, what we're going to want to look for um, and the question that comes from this, so you've got 50% of bioplastics coming from or are non-degradable. So is there a benefit to that 50% um, that are made from plants? So instead of extracting oil from the ground, is there benefit to growing uh, beetroot or sugar beet or corn, wheat, these products to then turn into a plastic? So that's what we'll explore a little bit further, um, which I found very fascinating and very surprising, actually. So... The three categories of bioplastics, which is something we looked at last year because we found this field incredibly confusing, um, which is really quite a shame. Um, so we've got degradable, which means it will eventually degrade. Whether it's petroleum-based, plant-based, doesn't matter, it'll degrade. Now, biodegradable is the next big 
topic. Now, this is the confusing one. It can often mislead consumers because the term biodegradable, there's no key definition, so to speak. Um, plastics that sit in this category are broken down by microorganisms such as bacteria, fungi, algae, into water, carbon dioxide, methane, biogas, and inorganic compounds in the course of a few months. Now they still need, these microorganisms need to be present for that, uh, I guess, process to occur. So if you throw a biodegradable thing into landfill, that might never break down because these microorganisms are not present. And this is exactly what Nick and Sumpus was talking about when you, know, you think a head of lettuce can decompose in you know, a week in the right environment, sometimes quicker, and you throw that into landfill and it could take up to 25 years. So nothing is as it seems when it comes to these categories. Which makes perfect sense because if you've got, you know, say a piece of plastic and then the lettuce and a piece of plastic, the, pl the, the lettuce has nothing to decompose like from. No soil, no, no bacteria. Correct, which is why sometimes you might find things wrapped in plastic last longer mm. because there's a lack of oxygen um, and certain compounds that decompose the material which is a shame, you know, obvious reasons plastic does seep into the uh, food. food as a result of that. And then we've got compostable plastics. Now these can be broken down in as little as three months and up to six months fully, leaving no trace or toxic compounds. Um, now this can be confusing, because I know what you're thinking, can it be composted in home or commercial? How did you know? I'm just a psychic. It is the question I had exactly, and most likely it's gonna be via an industrialized or a commercial composting facility because they will have the correct ratio of greens to browns and there's certain amount of things that you have to get right. However, again, there's no rule here. There's no regulations. So you might be able to just compost that plastic in your backyard, much like you can with paper and cardboard. How are we going to know? We just need regulations to speed up. We need the labeling to be very clear and very concise. So that if it says you need to take it to a commercial uh, composting sector, where is that even near me? Do I have that facility near me? So you're not paying this extra money for something that's gonna end up in landfill. So you might as well have bought a petrochemical based plastic. And you mentioned there's no trace of toxins at all. This How is that so if it is made with petrol? Well, the compostable plastics are in a biodegradable, so they're actually made from plants. Okay. You can't so have it. There are no compostable plastic that are made from petrol. That's correct. Okay, that so, makes sense. Yes, yeah, sorry for not mentioning that. So these three categories are bioplastic categories. Yeah. So with the degradable part and the biodegradability, what's confusing is that certain companies can use 20% or 30% biodegradability or 50% but still label it as biodegradable even though the rest is petroleum based, um, but compostable. For, it, for something to be labeled compostable and you know there's certain uh, forward thinking nations such as the EU that has to hit very stringent categories and testing, it has to be fully gone in six months with no trace. That's great. Mm. So then their labeling will say compostable. Compostable. And I don't know if you know this, but is that home compostable or does, is it still industrial size compost? Depends on the company. Yeah. So this is where... So no regulation in the EU is out Not for that, that I've read. Yeah. I've read many, about 30 to 40 pages of EU regulation today. Uh, I couldn't find anything, uh, but of course it is about a 300 page document, so I could have missed something, um, to be fair. Now the last monthly paradigm we discussed, there was 300, over 300 metric ton, million metric tons, going up to 400 now of plastics produced. When it comes to bioplastics... That's per year, right? Per year, mm -hmm. correct. When it comes to bioplastics, it's below 1% of that. It's about two to three metric tons. It's really a small fish in a big pond. So the question then becomes, in this conversation, which is incredibly important, can this be scaled safely to a level that can fully or partially replace crude oil plastics? because that's, a, I think, a question a lot of people have to sell your agriculture as well, this new technology. Can it fully replace um, beef and chicken and all these things? And, and the answer, long story short, there is yes. But the answer here is a lot more complicated and potentially surprising as well. 
So just to clarify on bioplastics, there's no definition yet. So this is where legislation really has to work to keep up. All it is, and the definition that's currently accepted, is it's a bio-based plastic that can be defined as a polymer composed or derived in whole or in part of biological products issued from biomass. And do we have a percentage of this part? Like, could it be 2% bio and 98%? I haven't seen a product that's 2%, um, but it, I've seen products that are 10%, 15%, 20%. So the lowest I've actually seen is 10% and it can be labeled as a bioplastic. Yeah. So this is where le regulations have to come in and say it has to be a minimum, like you mentioned, does it have to be 80% or 90%. So this is the exciting world that we can look forward to and, and complicated and lots of parliamentary inquiries and goodness gracious. So let's look at the real, a real world scenario. We talk a lot about Australia, obviously we're Australian. Now I thought I wanted to change it up a little bit to what a lot of people think is a forward country, very progressive um, when it comes to climate change and environment, environmentability, Denmark, oh. right? Northern Europe, they have a lot of things going for them. So obviously they are active in the, in the bioplastic space as a potential solution for them. So, and, and I thought in particular they're a fantastic case study because 1,000 tonnes of waste washes up on their western coast each year. So there's a lot of waste that they're copying and they, they have to think, okay. I wonder where that's coming from. Yeah, I actually don't know where exactly it is coming from, but they is have admitted. It's so northern. Like, where is it washing? You'd have really? to look into how the yeah. gyres were. Yeah. Because it could be from the Philippines or it could be from, who Probably knows Probably more like the UK. Could be the UK. Um, but Denmark is currently one third of its way to the 2025 and 2030 EU recycling obligations for plastics and packaging waste, which is great. And to ensure its achievement, they will continue to shift away from incineration. So that is their last case scenario. Now, arguably their most successful plan in the country is a deposit refund scheme, which is successfully bringing, and this shocked the crap out of me, nine out of ten single-use bottles and cans back wow that's incredible that's how much are they paying for this buyback you know what that is a great question i wish <laughs> i looked into but they yeah i don't know how much they're paying but it must be a decent amount to have nine out of ten um which is great so in terms of bioplastics denmark has the potential to lead the development within an already established industry which is which is there so I wanted to look into what, what are the plastic items that they're struggling with that they can't recycle or they can't control. And this one surprised me quite a bit. And it enters the ocean quite a lot in Denmark. And you, I don't think you'd be able to guess it, but it's uh, shotgun shells. You're joking. No, shotgun shells, obviously used for hunting. Now... <laughs> and are they coming from Denmark? Yes. Okay. Yep, Denmarkian. Another one you'd say. Denmarkian shotgun shells. So... They're do, metal, aren't they? Kind of, but not. Okay. No, it's actually plastic. So it has two components. We've got the shell, and then we've got a, a ward, a wad, I don't know how to say it, W-A-D, underneath, and then a shot cup. And the, the wad holds all the tiny pellets, and that's usually the plastic part. And that's the part that's really difficult, because if you look at how a shotgun works, whether you watch movies or whatever, you shoot, and the wad leaves with the pellets, and then if it's like a pump action, you pump it and the shell comes out. Mm -hmm. So they also have a problem with the recycling shells and, and littering of the shells, which that's, it's right there. It doesn't leave the gun, um, but the wad is the issue because that's gone. Mm -hmm. And the better the wad, the more concise the shot is. So they're very passionate about keeping that wad there, which is, um, I guess, understandable in their perspective. I didn't know they were such big hunters. Yeah, neither, but uh, what was the stat? I think they have about 180,000 registered hunters and 100,000 of them are in a club, their main international club. So now I'll put up a picture of what exactly the what is and whatnot, um, but in order to legally buy and use a shotgun in Denmark for hunting, um, much like Australia, hunting tests must be passed, which covers the species, uh, the animal biology, firearm safety, hunting and regulations. So as part of this test, one of the solutions could be to educate the hunters to not firstly litter uh, the shells. Um, and there are several products on the Danish market 
which is actually a biodegradable shot cups. Um, but what did we just talk about? They're not fully biodegradable. Um, and in fact, some of the ones that are invented are actually quite fascinating. They're like a dishwashing tablet. So they're soluble. So that when they leave, the eventually it decomposes in the water, much like in a dishwasher. You'd never see it afterwards. However, that's just microplastics. Yeah. It's just gone from physical to lower form. So I, I was contemplating whether or not to mention this issue because it is, you know, 200,000, just like shy of 200,000 hunters. It's quite a large issue in Denmark, which I didn't see coming. And there's no real solution. So the only real solution in their case would be don't hunt, um, get a recycling scheme for the shells, if you do. Um, now, I believe shells or some shells are reusable. Oh, really? I don't know that much about guns, to be quite fair, yeah. but it would make sense that they would be, unless, I mean, with a shotgun, it's quite a lot of pressure and gun panels, it yeah. bends the shell or, or yeah. something like that. But there are, I think there are refillable like rifle, rifle ones. Um, but imagine finding, especially if you're hunting, it disappears in all... Yeah cases but in a shotgun particular it doesn't so maybe there is a solution there it's a good point now the solution here is only for bio biotech to get better hunters as sad and as much as i want them to they're not going to stop hunting um, at least not with them listening to the show and changing their whole lifestyle <laughs> um, so there needs to be better solutions so where bioplastics should be used, where there's not like a reuse, refuse situation, there are some processes of testing. And now, to not bore people, I'll leave them linked in the show notes. You can head over to plant, theplantparadigm.com. It's on the big blog post there. But just talking about Denmark, no studies have been, been carried about on biodegradable plastics. So they've got this huge industry, no studies. So this is where the danger really comes in with bioplastics. They're confusing. And now there's no like huge convoluted studies in Denmark particularly. So this is where it gets really kind of frustrating because I don't know if you know this actually, most people probably don't, I didn't know. Um, but the Copenhagen City Council hands out approximately 130 tonnes of compostable food waste bags each year. Mm, that's great. Cool, right? There are some that do in Victoria even. Yes, correct, where your parents leave their hands it out that. Yeah. Now, sounds great here's where it gets crap in 2018 they had a pretty damaging revelation um, that copenhagen's compostable food waste bags was actually 70 percent fossil fuel plastic right so this is where i was talking about earlier not even the council and the city of copenhagen did its due diligence to find out is this biodegradable and at what level so they were, they were giving out 130 tons of these food waste bags for no purpose so was it actually degrading no it wasn't because we know from fact that the ones that my parents get they yeah. start degrading yeah, good. Yeah, on the are. kitchen bench you're like mm -hmm. hang on a minute i haven't finished using it yet and it starts disappearing correct so well done victoria for one mm -hmm. or some councils some in councils. victoria but yeah come on copenhagen yeah this is where it is further evidence of the conflating of the terms biodegradable and bio-based. So these bags were bio-based and they were selling them or- But they or have the same the term, chemical compound as the fossil fuel ones. Correct, so what they should be saying is biodegradable. Well, they shouldn't be because they're not, but that's what they should be giving out, right? Correct, yeah. correct. So public, pu following that publication, it was banned. So they, they were no longer handing out those bags. So that was oh, a huge- good. I'm yeah. glad that they saw their mistake and... They did, they did. But, you know, it's a big shame. They took this big progressive step and it was it backfired. And this, I really wanted to mention that because, you know, it, it's a big deal. And if... Well, if councils cities, can't even figure it out, then how are we supposed to figure it out? Correct. Um, so this affected, you know, 10 municipalities, 150,000 households. Um, it was a big big damage um, and in fact when surveyed they found that these these bags had actually a worse smell and they had high contamination rates it just it was not good and again this doesn't help the industry but the reason I want to bring up Denmark in particular is just because it is a real world application of a progressive country so this can happen in a very progressive place these issues are there and it proves again that maybe we're not ready 
for something or technology like this just hasn't been tested. I don't think we I think plastic came about before we were ready for plastic. Yeah. The 50s, like we were yeah. not ready for it then. And we're still not ready for it now. No. Because it's just, still around. Correct. So in summary, you know, the environmental studies in the vast majority of the environmental impacts or in the vast majority of studies show that there are some advantages to bio based plastics. So it's not biodegradable by base, such as reduced climate change potential and the reduced consumption of fossil fuel resources, obviously, but there are disadvantages stemming primarily from feedstock production impacts, such as increased acidification, eutrophication and human toxicity that includes like uh, runoffs from pesticides, etc. So I thought it'd now be productive after mentioning all the po- uh, negatives to look at the positives um, because there are definitely some. Um, Project Drawdown, who I love reading, they're a fantastic resource. Um, they basically have every pr- uh, problem in society, like agriculture, steel, heating, cooling, and they give full solutions to those problems. So fantastic resource for anyone to check out. But they did uh, the climate and financial impacts of bioplastics, actually, which is super convenient. Um, I'm going to leave what their assumptions were and what the actual scenarios were in the show notes again. But looking at taking up 12 to 50% of the market, there's absolutely no savings or cost in both scenarios that they looked at, which means that now we've, we can adopt up to 50% of our production of plastics as bioplastics at no cost except reduced climate impacts. So there are positives associated with bioplastics and the exact conclusion that they um, took is that in quotes, regardless of the possible refinements, this analysis suggests that the bioplastics market can grow to replace a significant portion of traditional plastics while reducing climate emissions, end quote. So I've mentioned a negative, a positive that it can, there is potential to scale it. And now again, I'm going to finish with a pitfall as well. So assumptions that had to be made for bioplastic because there are a lot of assumptions to make. Like I mentioned at the beginning, we're just 1%. You know, to grow to anywhere at 50% takes many folds increases. So firstly, we've seen plastics on the beach here and you can see plastics anywhere. That is really one of the most heartbreaking things you can see as a tourist and as a lover of nature. But there is a lot we can't see in the ocean, in the sediments, on the seafloor. Soil. Soil, that's right. A lot of these tests, when you look at bioplastics, so they do have to pass a certain amount of tests. They, there's a lot of problems. They do use temperatures in these tests that aren't real. Like if you create a plastic bottle and you test it in China, will it apply to a subtropical region in Fiji and will it break down at the same rate? No, it won't. No. And so there's no standardization, much like there's no definition. And the problem is now, if it goes into the ocean, there's actually certain organisms that stick to the plastic and it just sinks to the seafloor, will never be seen again. We don't know how that actually affects the ecology of the marine life and in turn the whole globe. So there's a lot of problems with the testing. Now, while there are also problems with the acidification and all that that I mentioned earlier, we can also save about two to 300 metric tons of carbon dioxide released a year. So everything comes at a cost. And I think why we can't really say that plast- bioplastics are good and bad is because there's too many variables. So we have extra acidification, eutrophication or pesticide runoff, but now we have savings of carbon metric tons released in the atmosphere. Which one is better for the environment? In the long run, who knows? You're going to need like the biggest math wizard to crunch so many numbers. You're going to need funding. Years of studies to figure that out. That's right. You just need a stupid amount. So, and people have started with the numbers. So globally around 170 metric tons, for example, is used for packaging. And this is annually, right? So 170 metric tons annually, which is 44% of global plastic production. Now, if we were to make that from bioplastics, we would need 613 metric tons of corn, which is 54% of global production. So obviously a lot of corn goes to animal and feedlots. Now we need 50% of that to just go to bioplastics. So that seems like 
way too big of an amount. Mm. And to even satisfy this amount of corn, and of course there's castor beans and there's wood and all these different polymers that you can make it from, we would need 61 million hectares of land, which is larger than France. So there's obviously problems with the land-based area. And of course there is one problem we can both relate to, which is then the belief of people. So let's say you have a bioplastic, and this isn't a fault of the bioplastic technology, but there was an interesting study in Scotland in 20, 2007 that showed that most participants felt that it was acceptable to litter biodegradable items. Oh, yeah. As they were seen as harmless, although participants did not distinguish between organic food waste and biodegradable plastics, which was fascinating. So this study appears to suggest the driver for littering is not apathy, but misinformation. So now we have a technology that is way ahead of its time, so to speak, a technology that hasn't been developed, but it's also confusing, misleading, and expensive. And imagine the amount of water that's needed to grow that corn, the pesticides that you mentioned that run off into our rivers, and the wildlife that are affected from that. Mm. Yeah, so I actually did run up how much water is needed, um, looking about 60% more than Europe's annual freshwater withdrawal. Oh my goodness. So 388 billion M3 of water. So what's, what's the hot take in all this? There's, there's a lot of information. And again, I do write all this down. So if someone wants to refer to the notes, the links, the studies, um, and there's a lot I didn't talk about that I noted down, please head over to theplantparadigm.com or the website is always linked in the show notes and, and have a read there as graphs, there's um, little research notes. It's actually maybe quite a bit easier to digest in this episode and my mumbling on. What's your conclusion? My conclusion is no. Bioplastics are not the solution to the plastic crisis. The evidence doesn't seem to support this. Um, now, I wanted it to be a solution. I really did going into this. I had a bias that, yeah, I think maybe they are a solution. There's a lot of possibilities to technology. I'm excited about this technology. I'm excited about the innovation. And a disclaimer, this whole topic came about because somebody commented on Instagram saying that bioplastics was the way of the future for us. Correct. And that refusing wasn't Correct. an option. So that's the reason we wanted to deep dive into this. And mm. now I agree. I come to like, I don't think it's an option. I think refusing, reusing and recycling as a last case scenario mm -hmm. is our only option i think you know there is a part of this world that maybe maybe there is a bit of bioplastics but there's there's just it seems to mislead the people so i think i agree with you fully and you know i did reach out to the person that did comment um, because the concept is you shouldn't bother about saying no to a straw because straws make up look they do it's like 0 0.02 percent to two percent of total plastic production so it's, it's nothing but Again, to a little small ecosystem and island, that means the world to them. Absolutely. The amount of straws that we saw on the floor in Phnom Penh. It's disgusting. It was. Mm -hmm. So if you can't, I feel like that's a little bit defeatist. And to be fully transparent, I did message this person to get him on the show to discuss his perspective. He said he would be happy to, um, but I haven't had a response yet. It's been a month or so. So... If he does want to come on, please, I'm more than happy to discuss this, but it just seems or like... Or anybody. If anybody anyone, is a expert in bioplastics, please enlighten us. Let us know, because we would love this to be part of our future. But at this stage, it doesn't seem like a viable option. Mm -hmm. Just refuse, people. Refuse. Yeah. That is the consensus. That is the too long, didn't read. Yeah. No, they are not the solution to the plastic crisis, but there is a lot going for it. Shall we get into the sustainability tip? Tell us. Okay, so before I take a drink because my voice is parched, let's be real. We've got a lot of droughts coming up. I feel like every time I turn on the news, I see a drought or on the other end a flood or whatever it is. And I think what's really important, I think a few years ago, actually, the media did a great job of really intensifying how important bees are. And there's a struggling bee um, problem right now. They are on brink of extinction, a lot of I've populations. 
are not doing so well. So I thought, what is a solution that would help us as humans, but also animals? And a lot of people maybe won't relate to this, but those who can have a, and that have a garden, I thought I would give tips on some plants that you can grow that are drought resistant. So I actually got this from The Guardian from a garden designer called Jane Gates, and I'll leave the link in the show notes below, but we've got a five categories of plants that you can grow. And please, again, use the website because I'm not going to pronounce these Latin names every day. Do you know how like crazy plant names yes. are? Yes, especially the like official names. Yeah, I've got the official names here. And I'm oh. looking at them like, man, these are Have some Have you not got the... Only two. I've only got two of the... Even then, they're like German. So, <laughs> all right, so the first one is... You know what? No, I'm not even going to try. I'm not even going to try. But there are... There's a sea holly. There's a whirling butterfly. Um, and these flower all, all day, all summer long. It just needs to be drained the soil in winters. Um, Drain the soil? Yeah, well-drained soil in winters. So oh, not well-drained. Well-drained, yeah, well-drained. So we've got a succulent, we've got a purple, deep purple flower, and it's actually got silvery, silvery leaves, which actually, it's really cool, it reflects the sunlight and catches in water. So it's one of these very efficient plants. And we've also got a... I'm going to try to pronounce this one. Veronicastrum virginicum. Sounds like so, a Harry Potter I was going to say the same thing. Yep. So there's, there's five plants, guys. Check out the website because gardening is something I think that can get you really connected to the land that you're on. While also, because a lot of people get stuck with the gardening um, side of things. What do you grow in it? And a lot of times, even Jane Goodall actually said this, we'll listen to a podcast. She's like, grow wildflowers. Mm. It's perfect for the bee population. The, but the pollinators are, are crucial. Um, so having a good garden, I think, is a, is a really good way for you to play your part in, in sustainability and, and a, dr- a thriving ecosystem. And I don't think this is just for those people that are living in droughts. It's just for bad plant parents. <laughs> they just don't know how to keep plants alive. These might be the ones for you. 100%. So head there. And then we've got good news stories. Yay! This is what we all look forward to. We do. We need some good news stories. I've got some good news stories, and these are nice and quick. That's what I like about these. Bang, bang, bang. Good news. So, my first one is that 30, for 30 minutes in August, solar power powered more of Australia than coal. That's amazing. Incredible. Is this all of Australia? Everything except WA, Western Australia, and Northern Territory. I'm not sure what the percent was, um, but this is hugely significant because this is the first time this overtake has happened during a business as usual scenario. So no problem happened or anything. This was just normal. Oh wow, solar overtook um, coal. Wow. So it hit 40%, and coal was at 38%. Renewables total um, was actually 60%. That's incredible. Seriously, so good. So I feel like uh, SA will be bringing up everyone's average though. <laughs> yes, 100%. I think it was actually a lot. I don't know if I, yeah, I did note this actually. It was mostly from rooftop solar panels. Excellent. So we are making a change there. We are making a change. And this is, this is where an individual can make a difference. So if you haven't got solar, there was actually a solar expo on recently oh, in Melbourne. It? So something to look at. Usually you can get really good discounts at expos. 100%. Okay, I've got a really weird good news story and just stay with me. Okay. Okay. So Tanzania made wildlife wildlife exports legal again. And I know you're thinking why would you say that that's a good news story? But just stay with me. (laughs) Some info about Tanzania. It is a home to an abundance of wildlife, including 20% of Africa's large, uh, Africa's large mammals. Mm-hmm. Back in 2016, Tanzania banned wildlife exports in a bid to protect its local animals from being shipped abroad. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Um, but in June, the Eastern African country decided to lift the ban. And there was a huge nationwide uproar about this. They were not happy about it. And the decision only lasted for one day. Wow. Excellent. So they listened to the people and they made this change. Um, So now wildlife exports are again illegal. Mm -hmm. Their tourism minister, uh, Pindi Chana, said that as a responsible minister, 
she immediately put a stop to the lifting of the ban. Um, there will be no exporting of live animals as we consult further and until the government decides otherwise. So look, they're not completely out of the woodwork there. For some reason, uh, why would they want this to be happening? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Zoos, I suppose, getting money from other countries. I don't know. Um, but in other good news with this, poaching has significantly declined in the country. And as a result, wildlife populations have started to recover, apparently about 40% in the last five years. Wow. That's fantastic. Actually, for anyone interested in that exact topic, tune in next week. I'm actually got, we've got Damien Manda mm -hmm. next week, who a lot of people might know him as the founder of International uh, Wildlife Anti-Poaching. I forgot what the actual acronym was for him, but he, he's in Game Changers, I believe he is, and he's an anti-poaching. So if anyone is interested in that, it's a great episode. But that's awesome news that they actually listen to the people, but does not sound like the work is done yet. No, it seems like it, the, um, it could come back in play. No good. All right, well, California votes to ban new gas cars by 2035. Well, this sounds very familiar. Yes, last month we talked about Canberra doing the exact same Thing. And now California, this is fantastic publicity, firstly. So now this is starting with 2026 models. 35% uh, of new cars, SUVs, and pick, small pickups sold in California will be required to be zero emission vehicles. Wow. Fantastic news. And they love their big cars over there that just pump the petrol. They do. America. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Um, now, what's really exciting about this is California, not just with this particular topic, it always leads the way with progression and other states follow suit. So we've got 15 states already expected to maybe bring in that rule as well. So we've That's got- That's massive. Right, 15 states, that is many tens of millions of individuals. So I'm thinking these are the progressive states. You know, I'm thinking so, but I haven't memorized them all. So I've just written down like it's Colorado in Minnesota as one of them. So a lot of states on the Northeast and West Coast. So it sounds like more progressive states. Conservative, technically Correct. down South. That's great news. Great news. So when are the rest of the states in Australia going to follow? This is fantastic. That's a great question. And I feel like there's a lot happening with this zero tech. And I feel like there's a lot of governmental change that is happening. And Maybe Canberra is the test, being the smallest oh, state. Oh, definitely. They're so progressive. Mm, which is weird still. I still wouldn't find that weird. But yeah, that, that is the episode. If you learned something, please reach out on the Instagrams or TikToks, wherever you find value. Um, we are still posting our Travel Asia situation. We're very much behind. We're about three weeks behind or maybe even four at this stage. Um, so we are posting them trying to be daily um, for food and, and travel and whatnot around Asia. Just making it possible, show you that it's possible to travel vegan. Mm -hmm. 100% and it definitely is. Um, now episodes coming out are pretty epic. Like I said, Damien Manda uh, next week. Um, honestly, incredible, incredible episode. So we've got Pinky Chandran after that. And that's about plastic issues, particular in, particularly in Bangalore and India, which we know India does contribute fair bit to plastic. Uh, and then we've got Matt Sapala, good friend of mine, talking about health and being sustainably fit. And then we have meteorologist, Dr. Andrew King, where we'll talk about climate change and atmospheric rivers. That is gonna be a very super informative episode. My first climate scientist, I think, that I've had on. So very cool. Uh, we do talk about Don't Look Up a bit, which is, I mean, for anyone who's into climate change and sustainability, it's it's got to be a must-see film on Netflix. Yeah, it's Netflix. a good movie. But that's all from us today. Thank you so much for listening and tuning in. If you have listened this far, come on, leave a review. I see how many of you listen in, and if every single one of you left a review would be very, very highly ranked. Um, so go ahead and do that. It takes one minute, um, and I will see you in next week's episode. Stay happy. Eat plants. Peace.